Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience. Welcome to our webinar on getting the climate story right. Um, thank you for taking the time out to join us today. I'm Namira Hamid, Advocacy Manager at Climate Outreach. At Climate Outreach, we are rewriting the climate story. Climate change affects all of us and involves all of us, but all too often, we see that the conversations about climate exclude and alienate people. So at Climate Outreach, we conduct original research to better understand what people from different places and backgrounds think and feel about climate. We work with people and organizations to help create the best stories. We support the best storytellers to engage everyone. And we also work with governments and policymakers in the UK and globally to show them the importance of engaging people in climate policymaking and policy rollout. We know that we can't tackle climate change without a new climate story, from a lost cause to a story of people, progress, and potential. Right now, I am sitting in, and I currently live in, the beautiful borough of Barnet in North London. My community may not be known for its climate action and uh, activism, but the people in my community um, deeply care about nature and wildlife. Concern about loss of nature has remained strong over the last few years, which is consistent with our research findings from Britain Talks Climate. We see that we are three times more motivated to tackle climate change if we feel connected to nature and if it resonates with our core values. Right, so how does this link to the general elections? This is a critical time to get the story right about climate and nature. Climate action needs strong leadership and a national climate story about people and possibility that we can all feel a part of. Um, this webinar will discuss two uh, election guides from Climate Outreach, which is getting the climate story right and talking climate on this doorstep. We'll be joined by a panel of climate communication experts to take your questions about how to cut through the noise with a brilliant story at election time. So to introduce uh, the very cool panel today, we have Holly from uh, Green Alliance, who will give her um, opening remarks, then followed by Dave from Climate Outreach, who will give a presentation about um, the two new election guides that we've produced. And then we have Matthew from New Economy um, Organizers Network, um, who will give his remarks um, before we uh, start the Q&A. So not to take any more of the time, um, Holly, can I turn to you first? What stories um, do you think need to be heard about climate change over the coming weeks and from whom? Over to you. Hi, yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, as John, I mean, I think probably in order to understand why it, the issue is so important, generally we need to take a little bit of a step back and look at the context a little bit broader. Um, so obviously we're in a critical decade for action on climate and nature crises, it's pivotal moment in our political history in terms of the political relationship we have with climate change as well. And I think in having made massive progress in recent decades, actually, on the narrative of climate, we've seen big changes and not necessarily positive ones in the way that political leaders talk about climate with you know, in the stories increasing on like scare tactics of environmental action as a risk and a threat rather than an opportunity. And I think because of the social and political context in the UK at the moment, so I'm talking like sky high energy bills, crumbling public services, a cost of living crisis that is affecting families up and down the country, parties are tempted to make an environmental you know, environmental action, a bit of a wedge issue, um, even if it hasn't been reflected in policy terms. So I think what's important for us at Green Alliance is like in just kind of trying to cut through and instead of getting political parties to run scared, really, and in the hope that arguments don't cut through, what we need is political leadership and ambition and ways of making it appealing to the public in a, t in a normal way that doesn't feel like it's just very Westminster-centric. We can't ask individuals to take action without a clear steer from government that it's an important agenda and that they're going to help people with the transition so that no communities are left behind. And 
obviously we are in terms of the broader election narrative we are in a very crowded field for issues to talk about as we head towards polling day um i'm in absolutely no doubt that cost of living and economy generally are going to be central to the framing but we do need climate to be part of that conversation if we're going to create the ambition for climate and nature post-election regardless of what the outcome is so what we need to do is show that it is both ne both necessary and extremely popular. We need, you know, to show that climate change consistently makes top five issues in polling with the public. And like you say, often that is on much more relatable grounds, like what the amenities you have locally, what parks do you have, that kind of thing. And we need to draw people away from the cultural divisions that are being created with the net zero cost, debt, tax narrative. But obviously, to do all of that, we need to ensure that current and prospective politicians, as well as members of the general public, feel confident to talk about what the opportunities of the transition are and are able to articulate why it matters now and why we need ambition and unity going into the next parliament. So I think the main thing for us is that regardless of what happens on polling day, we need a cross-party consensus on climate action in the next parliament because Ish, all of these issues and the things that Dave will touch on today are inherently political, don't get me wrong, but also I fundamentally believe they shouldn't be party political. Not only do we need to create, you know, certainty for businesses if they're going to invest in the UK transition, but from a people-centred perspective, everybody should have the right to live in a home that is affordable to keep warm, that's powered by electricity, that doesn't contribute to the climate crisis, where they can access nature from their doorstep, and see a natural world that is thriving to the benefit of both their mental and physical health and the benefits that that then brings to us as a society. And I think you would genuinely be hard pressed to find an MP from any party that didn't want those things for their constituents. So regardless of how we get there, what we need to do is make sure that it's an issue that cuts across party divides, both before and after the election, and that we can sell to the general public, no matter who they vote for, that it's a massive opportunity to lead the world as we decarbonize and create you know jobs of the future because unless we people bring people along with us and unless we ensure it is a fair and just transition it is not going to work but in order to do that both politicians and members of the public and you know as people talk to their friends their family we need them to have confidence in how they have those conversations and why they have them which is why i think this is so important today Excellent. Thank you so much, Holly. Um, I won't take too much time and uh, give the floor right over to Dave. Thanks so much, Namira. Thank you, Holly, for the intro. I'm Dave, uh, Senior Advocacy Manager at Climate Outreach. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to just talk for about 15 minutes or so. Namira, shout at me if I'm going over. Um, about a couple of bits of advice that we've put out in the last couple of weeks. How to talk about climate change right now, what people think about climate change in an election context. And kind of as Holly was saying, as Namira was saying, helping us all keep a bit of perspective and how to cut through the noise, this, this incredible noise that is an election campaign, remembering what makes for great climate communication in general and what makes for great climate communication during an election campaign. And then possibly for those of us who are out having doorstep conversations or day-to-day -day conversations, a few tips that we've pulled from across our work from across the years that might make for great conversations. So um, Lauren will probably, pep oh yeah, Lauren's done it now, we'll pop pepper this uh, conversation with links to stuff that I'm talking about. You'll find this all on our website as much as, uh, as well as much other stuff. So I'm mostly gonna talk about um, a new guide that we just put out called Getting the Climate Story Right for the 2024 general election. Um, and this is what I'm going to cover. We're going to cover um, things to remember, the headlines that we are finding from our research, the research of others. Holly's already mentioned some of it. I'm sure Matt will bring some of this in as well about what people actually think and feel about climate change right now. Um, some do's and don'ts, some hot tips for how to talk about climate in an election context, which hopefully will be useful beyond an election for you as well. And then, as I said, a few tips for doorstep conversations. So let me start straight away with four things to remember right now this is just have this in your head whenever you're thinking about climate conversation these are what we're finding from our britain talks climate research what's been fairly stable over the years and what we're finding in other bits of research as well this is where people are at 
So the first thing is to remember that climate leadership is a vote winner. Broadly, it makes people happy and positive. Broadly, the idea of climate change is something people want to see a government act on. They expect the next government, whoever that is, to get on with it, and they want them to spend money on it. That at the headline level is what people think about climate change, the issue. And secondly, that it's perfectly normal to care about climate and nature. We're long past the point where only freaky weirdos care about climate and nature. Well, that's normal too. Everybody does. Uh, most people, we, we find that nature in particular is really keenly felt. Namira talked about it in her opening remarks. We, we in Britain care about climate and nature. We need to tell the story in our climate communications that that is a perfectly normal thing to do. There's not some uh, there's not some reason to be ashamed of saying that this is how things are. Thirdly, that actually stuff is going on. Seeing is believing that in communications in general and right now, it can be very easy to make big abstract claims, big fluffy promises about hundreds of thousands of jobs and big visions, which people are a bit cynical about. But actually, there's so much brilliant stuff happening in every, you know, not, not just in Barnet, Namira, but right across the country, there's so much amazing stuff going on. It's great news. It makes people feel that their uh, community is doing stuff. And we just need to tell that story, make it real to people, whether that's businesses or schools or whatever's going on. But fourthly, of course, and this is, you know, the reality of some of the conversation that's being had at the moment, times are tough. The cost of living crisis, as Holly said, is a big deal. Some people are really worried about what the costs of climate action might mean for them. And you need to empathise with that and understand it and not to try to pretend that doesn't exist in communications. But to remember that people think it's the government's job to sort that out, to make the transition seem fair. And they look to the government for leadership and not to be left on their own. Um, so just a bit more on those on those four points. Firstly, remembering that people want politicians to get on with climate and nature action. They see it as the government's job. Uh, we did some research. This research is from our new Britain Talks Climate Toolkit, an update to our 2020 Britain Talks Climate Toolkit and research. And it was conducted at the very end of last year and the very start of this year. So it's pretty up to date. And we found, and we're finding this across the piece, that when you ask people, would you vote for a party that keeps the current pace of climate action or speeds it up, nearly two thirds of people, 60% say that they would. Fair few people say they don't know or they're not sure, but only 15% of people say they would actively vote for a party that would slow it down. The headline story is there is no particular mandate for slowing down. In fact, the opposite. People want to see action. They want to see, if anything, more of it. And broadly, we think it's good news for that to happen. The idea of net zero, um, and Namira is going to ask questions I know about that term and whether it's helpful, but the, the, the idea of climate action at an economy wide level, this thing that is climate action in the UK, people think it's good news in, in generality. And again, only 10% of people actively think it's bad news. These are great things. If you consider the, the cost of living crisis and everything that's happened in politics and the state of the world and the state of people's trust in institutions right now, it seems pr pretty remarkable. And we as communicators should take a great deal of heart, I think, from the fact that people still think climate action is important um, and that it's good news that they do so. And broadly, it's in that category of good thing. People, we asked, uh, how would you feel of a political party, any political party pledge significant climate investment? And we did some cluster analysis on the words that people used and half of the words that came out were positive, only 23% of them negative, the rest being quite neutral. This word happy was the single most used word in that positive cloud. So first thing, the good news, this stuff makes us feel uh, positive and makes us feel happy. Secondly, most people do care about it. It is normal to care about climate and nature. And we see this so as part of our Britain Talks Climate work. We did focus groups with all of the seven segments. I won't, don't have time to go into those segments, uh, but the Britain Talks Climate Toolkit that Lauren's put a link to uh, will go into much more detail. Even amongst segments of the population where people are a bit less sure, a little bit more worried about the costs, a bit more worried about transition, we still find this story of just a kind of day to day. Yeah, I care about this. We care about this. We can do something about this. Right. So this is from a, a member of one of our focus groups from the so-called disengaged traditionalist segment who, uh, who might be expected to be a bit more uh, suspicious and cynical, perhaps, of some of the details of transition. But there's this desire and this normal sense of doing our part. And that's what we do. We should tell that story. It is normal. People that we talk to want this to happen. It's a great communications thing. 
And remember, as Holly said, that you know, despite everything, it's the fourth highest priority to act on climate and nature. It depends, you know, our poll put it as fourth. I've seen it as high as third. Um, it's round about top five for sure. For some people, it's even higher than that. So there is this normal sense of wanting it to be tackled by government. Now, thirdly, this thing about how important it is to get tangible and practical and, and in communications, seeing is, is believing, actually seeing something tangible and specific. Um, change can be scary for people. I'll come to that in a minute. And the, the idea of abstract change and the idea of abstract costs uh, can make people worried and, and fearful about what that might mean. But actually seeing that specific stuff has happened, which is normal in your place that feels like a normal place for you is so powerful. Um, people are rightly sceptical, I think, of big claims that things will be better in future, that this transition will be different to the last 40 years of transitions. But around the climate, around the country, climate action is already creating jobs, helping businesses, uh, helping with energy bills, being part of how town centres are being fixed, part of what schools are doing, what apprentices are learning, what's happening to transport and how it works. It's not separate to the things that people want to see happen in their lives, the jobs and the health benefits and the better housing and the uh, empowering the next generation. It is absolutely at the heart of that. Climate is the story that is underpinning the real things that people look to for great examples of stuff that's happening. So where we can see that and we can be specific, particularly when we're doing more local campaigning, drawing that out and telling that story is so important. And there's plenty of it to find. And the fourth point in communications is, is this critical point of empathy. I will come to this a bit at the end of my talk about, uh, about how to have conversations on the doorstep. We have found in our research that people, um, while they are su really supportive of climate action at the sort of national level, that particularly for people on lower incomes or people who are more reliant on using their car or more used to using their car, particularly for some people, there's a worry that the transition won't be fair. And this in a climate of kind of political distrust is really really important and we need to empathize with that you know this is just one quote from one of our focus groups about how people we were discussing the costs of transition and what needs to happen electric cars and this sort of things and it's part of a general sense that, that that when people talk about a potential unfairness or a potential worry to them it's part of a general kind of sense that things are not fair my costs are going up and here's another thing and empathizing with that in our communications, you know, times are tough is really, really important. It's not, you know, we can tell a great story about specifically how things will be better, but that doesn't mean we have to pretend that times aren't tough for people and empathizing with that and listening to that. Um, and remembering that the thing that comes across our research over the years, time and time and time again, and it unites rich and poor, young and old, north and south, right across the segments, is this idea that people on the lowest incomes or the people who have done the least uh, to cause climate change or the people who are living the least extravagant lives shouldn't be asked to do the same as the people who are causing the most damage or have the most money to fix it. And the only thing, we tested a load of different policies, and the only thing that had a majority of people going that that would go too far would be if everyone, regardless of income, had to pay for low carbon technology themselves. So, so people are alert to it and sensitive to it. And we find in our research either some combination of people either being worried potentially about a cost they might have to pay or a cost that they think the country in general right now uh, might not be able to bear. So having an answer to that is really important in communications, empathizing with it, but taking it back to the fact that it is the government's job to make the transition fair and to make it something that we're all part of. People want to feel this is a whole society effort taken seriously by governments first and foremost. So a few do's and don'ts for what all of that means. Uh, and these are in an election context, they're advice for how to, if you're writing climate communications or talking to politicians right now, how we suggest based on our research over the years and our Britain Talks Climate work, you do and don't talk about climate change right now. It'll be interesting to get into this, I'm sure, in the, in the panel. And I, I underpin these with some, some principles that just make for good climate communications in general and go back to those things that we need to remember about where people are actually at. So your climate communication should show that climate action is normal. It's not fringe. It's not weird. It is normal. People want it to happen. Do say that most people care about climate and nature and they want to see action from politicians because they do, because that's true. And try not to give airtime or try not to give undue precedence 
to the fringe, and it is a fringe, uh, groups of people out there in certain political parties, in certain parts of the press, who are trying really hard to make climate change a culture war issue. Matthew and Neon have done some brilliant work on the culture war stuff, and I'm sure he'll talk about it um, in, in his questions. Don't feed it, don't give it airtime. It's not the story of what normal is. Don't give air that they don't deserve to people who are trying to say that we can't bear this. Actually, most people want to see it happen. Secondly, show climate action is not something off separate to the side of the stuff people care about or to the side of housing or health or all these things to the side of the cost of living. It's joined up. It's part of it. This is one of the engines that can help sort this stuff out. Do say that climate action can help with the cost of living and it's, better, it's good for our bills. Don't try and say that, oh, well, the cost of living crisis isn't important because we've got the climate crisis. I do see this in communications, trying to say that you shouldn't care about this thing you care about because there's another thing you're not caring about enough over here. That doesn't work. It doesn't work for people. It really doesn't work in an election context where the battleground is so much about people's day to day lives and the, and the cost of living. And in fact, it's not even true because climate action helps us with the issues that are affecting us right now. And it's part of all our stories from, from housing to health. Try not to pit these things against each other. Thirdly, look, climate action, as well as being normal, it's just common sense. It's smart. You know, it's a good, smart economic story. It's a smart uh, strategy for the UK. And obviously, this how this works will depend who you're talking to and what sort of um, what sort of arguments work best for them, for more right-leaning segments in particular. The idea that this is just a smart thing to do. The next government can show how to tackle the cost of living crisis and climate at the same time. Look at this economic opportunity. Look at what we can do with wind and wave and solar power and the benefits it can bring to us. This is not a radical idea. This is what the whole world is doing. And trying not to not, not to portray the, the, the change that needs to happen to our economy as radical. People don't generally like radical stuff. They don't like the idea of radical stuff, particularly not in an election where everyone's being very mobilized to think about the here and now. It doesn't need to be seen as radical. It isn't radical. It's just common sense. It's what some of the world's largest economies are cracking on with. Um, Really important point, I think, and I'd love to hear what the other panelists think about this, but you, you do sometimes see in communications this idea of climate and nature being treated separately, both conceptually and as policy issues. Um, and most people don't see it like that. We, we see in our research time and time again that when we ask people why should we act on climate change, the first thing they go to is because they love nature and they protect nature. And these things are joined up in people's heads. They're not separated in the way that policy wonks um, and sometimes communicators do. They are one big issue. So don't try to pit these against each other. If you think we're not talking about nature enough, well, probably we're not having enough conversation about climate and nature in general, but try not to pit the climate people and the climate issue against the nature issue and to make this some sort of turf war. It doesn't work for people who don't see them as separate and it's probably not helpful in general anyway. Um, and then finally, I think this is my final slide in this section, show that it's possible. Like, Climate change is bad, the impacts are bad and people are feeling those impacts and our research shows are more and more worried about it. And it's not gonna magically be brilliant just because we do a bit of communications, but we have to show that actually politics and elites and institutions can deal with this thing. Now that's a challenge in a climate of political distrust and I'm not gonna pretend it's always an easy conversation to have, but what you can't do is feed that by making it seem like whatever happens, we're buggered. Whatever happens, politicians won't act. Actually, voters do think whatever party that wins can act on climate, and they think overwhelmingly that there's still time to act on climate change. There isn't this fatalism, really. And try not to feed the idea that maybe a more day-to-day -day kind of uh, distrust or scepticism about politics will somehow ruin the idea of politicians and elites acting on climate change. Don't feed that idea, make it seem possible, make it seem like something we together with political leadership can act on. So finally, just a few slides, it'll only be a, a minute or two, and thank you so much for your for your time. About some tips, there might be some people on this call, we know we, we work with all sorts of political parties and activists and, and doorsteppers who've asked us for advice on how to have those climate conversations that might come up on the doorstep. And here's some tips that might be useful for you in, in general. Um, so this is from a guide that Lauren's put the link to um, with some nice shareable infographics if you'd love to share it. 
Um, and based on actually a bit of work that uh, I think are by, by far our most downloaded bit of work over the years called Talking Climate that we released in 2019 about how to have cli great climate conversations and how to how such a large part of that is remembering actually that most people do care about this and most people do support climate action. The, the real world is not like Twitter. The real world is a lot less shouty. Most conversations will go well and having that in your head is important. Don't be scared of conversations you might have about climate change. We released uh, just a few weeks ago, one of the most exciting bits of work I think we've done for a long time about what makes for a great trusted climate communicator, what makes for authenticity. And it's so important in any conversation and any communications to be seen as authentic. And that means being trusted. And I don't remotely have the time to do it justice here, but th there's a link uh, in, in the chat. I think I can't see it, but I'm sure Lauren has either put it or will put it. These three things came out from our research uh, into what people go for, what people think makes for trust in climate communication, in communication in general, is being empathetic and people thinking, yeah, that person actually really is interested in me and my life and cares about me and isn't trying to sell me something. Humans are very high thresholds for being alert to people trying to sell them stuff. Secondly, that the passion comes across and it's believable and people think that actually, yeah, that person does care about this. Uh, they're not just reading lines from a script. I may not agree with them, but at least they, I can see that they're coming from a position of, of conviction and passion. And thirdly, be incredible. It doesn't mean everyone has to be a climate scientist, but it means saying stuff that feels like it is backed up and you've thought about it and there's some evidence behind it. These three things in combination make for great trusted climate communications in general and are so important for those interpersonal things where actually we make judgments on this really, really quickly, often without thinking or realizing that we're doing it. Um, this is all This is all right to the heart of the Talking Climate resources, a, a link there at the bottom left of the screen. Um, so much of climate conversation actually is about listening and responding and making sure that people understand you have heard and not trying to win the conversation. It's, it's really tempting, isn't it, when we're having conversations about climate change, um, to always be thinking of the thing we can say next that can win the argument and persuade the person we're talking to um, that we are right. Well, actually, real conversation, particularly trusted conversation, don't work like that. And Asking questions and listening, being authentic and finding that common ground. I mean, we know this anyway, I think, from how we have great conversations in our life. This is so important. And then if there are any sort of political people doing activism or campaigning on the call, and, and this is part of a much bigger thing, you know, don't people want to feel that you can help them if you can help them. But there's nothing worse. Um, I think Namira said in the meeting we were just in earlier, there's nothing worse than asking people for their opinions on a plan that you actually don't have any, any intention of doing anything about or any idea that you're going to actually help them. So being honest about what you can do and what you can't do is much better than promising the world and not being able to do it. And final thing, a bit of advice, if you're out there having a great climate conversation, and again, these are just good things to have to hand, whether you're working nationally or, or locally, just having some sense of what people do care about, where climate and nature cross over with people's lift concerns and the things they're concerned about locally. So there might be worries about flooding, there might be excitement about a new industry opening up. So understanding a little bit of, of what makes for uh, a great place to start a local conversation. And again, what the great things that are happening. These, these are two important things to get right if you get a chance beforehand. And then, you know, we would advise as Climate Outreach a bit of a plug for our broader advocacy work. We want to see all parties commit to engaging the public on an ongoing basis as part of the years of climate change policy that we still have to come. Um, everyone needs to feel part of a conversation about climate change, not just at election time. And one of the things we find in our focus groups is people thinking they're only really sought out when they want their vote. We want all parties to have plans on public engagement. And uh, if you get the chance to ask any politician that you get hold of or any insider network that you're part of what their plans are, uh, it's probably a very useful thing to be able to say to people, this is our plan for how we will continue to bring you into the conversation. So that's it. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, there's a link there to a feedback form, although I'm going to stop sharing my slide now because we're not finished. Yeah.
I will put it in, in the <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Dave, so much. Um, I loved how sort of with everything that you were saying, there were so many examples we did um, fed in. Um, and I hope that everyone listening in today also find um, those very useful. So just to open our Q&A um, session, um, Matthew, I, I'd like to turn towards you and ask, um, would you would you be able to share your thoughts on the political importance of a positive climate nature net zero story in the public debate um, at this election time and why the next parliament um, matters and why we need ambition and unity on climate. So there's lots going on there, but um, your thoughts on any of these would be appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Samira. Um, yeah, and thanks, uh, Dave and Holly. It's super interesting. Um, yeah, I'll share a couple of thoughts. I won't take very much time because I'm sure lots of people have got lots of thoughts. Um, I guess the first thing is to just like echo uh, what Holly said, which is that it is a very crowded field, this election. It's not a climate election. In 2019, it was, it was arguably a Brexit election in lots of ways, but it was also a kind of just a climate election at the same time. 2019 was a very climatey year for lots of different reasons. Public opinion was really spiking about it. There was a climate debate. There was a bit of a race to the top on climate policy when it came to the parties. Um, and that is not the case this time. And I think that's something that's really worth bearing in mind. Having said that, it's interesting uh, in terms of like positives that some climate and environment policies are polling as the most popular. When YouGov did a list of all the policies and got people to rate them, the number one was a Lib Dem policy about protecting rivers the number four was uh labor's policy on gb energy that's interesting to me like that's people picking them out of a list and li liking them for favorability so i think that's something that should be yeah it should be a positive thing for us to think about um and it kind of rings true what dave said which is that climate is a vote winner if it's framed in the right way um also i think it is worth saying and again in terms of positive climate message that this is not an election where climate has been sort of culture ward very successfully, which is interesting because the government and reform are actually trying to do it quite actively. You know, they had this on Saturday, they had this like war on the motorist day and it kind of sunk without a trace. And now that's partly obviously because the government is in free fall, the, everything they touch uh, turns to, is there like a non-sweary version of that? I don't know, anyway, turns bad. Uh, it, and I think that's, you know, one of those things in an election, the dynamics are not really always not set by campaigners so much. They're set by lots of different forces out of our control. But I don't think climate has been successfully culture ward uh, at this point. And that's a positive. We'll, I'll talk in a second about what might happen. And I have a like, side note thought, which is that the like damp, not very warm weather is quite an interesting one. Like if there was to be a massive heat wave as per a couple of years ago, like, what would it mean? in terms of the climate conversation, would we be in a different time? Because I think sometimes when people are feeling impacts, it can really change the conversation. So I just wondered idly actually this morning as to whether or not that could be something that um, changes things. Um, I just say one of my fears, which is the, while this is not a race to the top on climate, this election, it's not a race to the bottom on climate either, but there does feel like a bit of a race to the bottom on investment and tax. And it feels like that what the government are trying to do is kind of trash the house on the way out in a way, because their legacy will run longer than just them in government. And I think they've somewhat successfully cornered the Labour Party into basically saying we're not going to spend any money. Now, obviously, their actual manifesto plans will have them spending money. But I think that what we can expect is quite a lot of attack on them if they plan to basically borrow money or raise taxes. And it does feel like the IFS are saying and others that they're just going to have to do that and I, I worry about that as someone who's interested in narrative environment what's the space in which political parties can operate I worry that they're quite boxed in actually um and that's something to think about you know you if you hear Labour politicians repeatedly saying the word tax burden like I worry about their environment that they're going to walk into there if they don't think they can raise um tax so clearly kind of co-benefits are really important um this speaks to what you were saying, David, about empathising, right? Like, at this moment, it's just very clear that the more you can articulate climate and environment policies through co-benefits, ways in which it will benefit you in other ways, then that's great. I mean, I thought Sadiq Khan actually did this really successfully with the ULEZ and talking about health, like, really effectively. Now, it was not the most popular policy, if you looked at it, polled against other policies, but he obviously had a very successful election. And every time I heard him talk about 
the low emission zone, he said about children's lungs are smaller now, but they can improve. And I just thought, well, that's a real message discipline that's really interesting. And I think there's something something to learn from that, actually. And I think there's lots of opportunities when it comes to framing climate as to having like, all of these benefits. And then just to get to the point, um, Namira, as you said about what, kind of what's after the election, I, I guess for me, what I think could happen is... I mean, I'm, this is not, I'm not an expert on this, but it just seems quite likely is that Labour win this big majority. The Tories and reform potentially poll quite similar in percentage terms. And there is like a quite extreme moment on the right of British politics that either sees the Tories lurching to the right or sees reform making a land grab or something along those lines. This is one possibility. One of the cornerstones, clearly we've seen this, of their thing is anti-net zero, stoking up a culture war. That's That to me poses a risk. On the other side of the political spectrum, the Greens are probably going to have their best election ever. They will see a Labour Party that is like, will always, their job is to say that the Labour Party is tame on climate, right? Like that is the Greens' job. So we could have quite a polarised situation where the two parties of the left and right have their best elections ever. And there's a big, quite polarised situation. And I think for me, in policy and narrative terms, the worry is that Labour then don't really address some of the big things head on. They're not bold in their policy making or in the way that they, um, yeah, and that could recreate a problem, a sort of gilet jaune situation where there's this sense that actually climate policy is going too fast, people are being left behind. And I think that's a, you know, that is something that I think is very concerning. Now, I will just finally say that I really agree with Dave on the like, you don't need to talk about policies being radical. So Labour, in my view, probably needs to have some big, bold, radical policies that involve uh, investment changing people's lives quite quickly but you don't need to call them bold or radical you can call them common sense and so i think for us as a movement of people who are interested in climate that definitely means supporting and helping communicate better about policies that have those kind of co-benefits but also probably it just means it's something to recognize is that when labor labor are gonna you know address any of the issues we have head on they do need to just do some basics like getting rid of the child benefit cap, for example, because it is very difficult for people to understand why we're spending money on climate policies. And obviously we communicate with this as well as we can. If there are some really basic things that the Labour Party are not doing to like fix some of the inequalities and in entrenched poverty in our society. So I think that's kind of that's one of the things I've been kind of pondering. Um, but yeah, I think I'll stop there. I think it's a very interesting time. And yeah, I'd, be, I'd love to know people's thoughts. Yeah. No, thank you so much, Matthew. Um, I, I like that we're sort of digging deeper into the conversation. And just to build more on what um, Dave and Matthew have said, Holly, I'll turn to you to sort of look at um, the use of language and messaging. We see from our research that the idea of net zero is not the problem. The idea of ULIS in that we see here, um, as you know, Matt gave the example, is not the problem. But some some of these terms like net zero and emissions carry have started carrying a lot of baggage. So instead of using terms like emissions, is it more helpful if we, you know, plain language like air pollution? Um, so all of this becomes super important now um, in these weeks leading up to the election. So what are your thoughts on the um, some of the best public engagement uh, messaging um, and how to connect with people? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I think the best way to think about it is in the context of a general election campaign is very different to any other time because you're talking about individuals that conversations that are happening on constituency level right in a way that never happen otherwise apart from an election campaign and actually what we know about climate policies and actually i i do agree as much as people think net zero does have this like cut through with certain people there aren't necessarily issues i actually think it's such a broad umbrella term that it is becoming quite unhelpful and it's becoming quite unhelpful both with the public but also with people in Westminster and I think people feel quite confused and conflicted about where to even focus that if someone talks about net zero and it's so much more accessible if you can talk about it in terms of individual policies and how it affects individual constituencies how that will affect individual you know every borough of london is going to be different somewhere in the northeast is going to be totally different somewhere in scotland like they're all totally different constituencies but they all have very similar 
cut through messages that sewage works right people get that people understand that people really care about air pollution people re feel really passionate even if they don't have kids that you know i completely agree on sadiq's messaging it's it really works energy company profits you know the the idea of injustice that really cuts through to people so the idea of a windfall tax to them like be able to fund wider environmental me measures are incredibly powerful and people really understand them and you can make what are very complicated things you know if you've got in think tank terms you've got people talking about like modal shift and you're like well what what you're not going to say that to the public it's fine in a report but like what does that mean as soon as they start saying well do you want a cycle super highway where it's safe to like take your kids out at the weekend and not be worried about them being hit by cars those are inherently environmental measures but it's then packaged in a way that really makes sense to people and makes it real to their lives. And I think that is what politicians, to be honest, on the whole, are not very good at. And a lot of them don't necessarily understand the nuances themselves. And that's something that we need to get better at helping them navigate that and how to talk about it. And that's why, you know, a lot of the messaging, the top lines that Dave went through are so important. And I wish like every MP after the election could sit through the, the outcomes of your, your report. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Holly. Um, Dave, um, I'll uh, sort of turn towards you to see if you have any remarks on what um, Holly and Matt have said. Uh, oh, plenty, really. I think the the main thing is on the net zero question, because I, I, I know we spend a lot of time in the mirror talking about this. I do think it, I do think how you talk about this stuff matters, actually. And Net zero is probably a useful phrase if you're in a corporate boardroom or you're writing a policy paper and you want to describe this thing that is a kind of technocratic economic exercise in a couple of words that makes it clear that it, it's all going to be all right in the end, which is kind of what net zero is trying to do. It, it's all right for that. It's fine for that. It's absolutely flaming useless at talking about what it is. Like it's what it is, is about climate action across the whole of society as part of a project to make loads of stuff we really care about better and happen and i just completely agree with holly that like, whenever you can say if, if what you mean is better buses say better buses if what you mean is more parks or more trees or your kids having a job when they leave school or the town center that's fallen to bits over the last 20 years getting better if that's what you mean talk about talk about that um and i think we it's, you know, God knows I catch myself doing it all the time. It could be so hard for us, I think, even those of us who work in communications to just un to, to talk like a normal person, but it's so important. And the normal person conversation on climate change at the political level doesn't happen anywhere near enough. It's still, it's still kind of technical and big mission. And, and that's one of the things I found a bit disappointing about the leaders, the first leaders debate, where I don't think either side, you know, particularly maybe, um, Labour were really saying anything human about climate and net zero. It was all, you know, competing visions of like economic stuff. So just talk like a human. It's uh, the essence, I suppose, of, of every like if one slide to rule all the slides that I did is talk like a human. Just behave to behave like a human, talk like a human about stuff. It's the essence of good climate communications and have honest conversations with people. So yeah, I do worry about it actually. And I think it's because it's such a technocratic kind of anything term that's deliberately chosen to mean anything to loads of people. I think that allows it to be demonized as here's another example of an example of how they don't care about you. It's a technocratic phrase. It's a phrase that shows, you know, instead of heart and soul, they've got this thing. And I, as Matt was saying, like I do think in the long run, there's actually a bit of a, there's a battle for the soul of what this project is. And I think using terms like that don't help. Um, I love the two examples, sort of the multiple examples that we've seen uh, coming from Holly and Dave. Matt, if I turn to back to you, um, I, I liked how you talked about the positives of um, Sidi Khan's policies, um, because mostly we've been seeing sort of the negative uh, sort of vitriol coming in. So just to sort of continue the, <laughs> the, the feeling of positive um, uh, climate action, are there any more examples that you'd like to share about sort of the um, uh, good examples of turning difficult, complicated uh, uh, phrases and concepts into simpler ones that have worked well in the past in the UK or you know from other countries as well um, I think it's 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 good to look at just good examples 
Yeah, I think, yeah, that's a good shout. I, I'm going to like half answer your question and also half have a dig at Keir Starmer at the same time. Um, because I was just thinking about how actually um, could, on the debates, I, I, so let me just zoom out for a second. I think in any, if you're ever being interviewed on TV or radio or whatever about climate or anything else, you basically always have to try and get in a solution. I think it's really important. We kind of call it the fatalism litmus test at Neon. Like, don't leave people thinking there's just more problems in the world. And so for me, like good messaging in answer to your question is always going to come up with solutions. And when I watched the debates, I, I really thought that Keir Starmer kind of missed a trick because he not only didn't really talk about climate, about the impacts of it, which I think is really easy to do. You can talk about impacts in the UK, for example, it's really easy to do and talk about how that's got worse over time and stuff. But with the solution, I just feel like something like with GB energy or in, indeed renewables, talking about energy security and bills is just a really easy one to win at the moment. And I think that's something we all agree on. It's like, but yeah, I just feel like that's where the the best messaging can be. And actually, I've seen quite a lot of it I, from NGOs, to be honest. I feel like NGOs have really adapted really well to talking about energy security, to talking about like households and income and stuff like that. And for me, that's really promising because I think what a lot of people want, it's an interesting election because it's clearly an election where people want change in terms of politics. But what you hear all the time in focus groups, or if you've ever knocked on people's doors, is people just being like, I actually just want to know what things are going to be like for a little bit, you know? So it's that thing, it's like security and stability. And they, I think that the best messaging in a sense on climate and especially on energy is all about security and stability, basically knowing what your outgoings are going to be for the next few months or years. Excellent. Sorry, I was waiting a little bit because my um, doorbell is going off, but we will ignore it. Um, so now um, I will go around um, to each of you, Holly, Dave and Matt. Thank you so much for um, all of your remarks and presentation. But just to sort of conclude um, this excellent conversation, I will go around um, to see if you have any last sort of parting remarks to leave with our audience. 15, 20 seconds max, your last final message for the day. Um, we'll start with Holly. Oh, no pressure. Um, I think where I'm at at the moment is is a mix of, you know, optimism and utter despair. And I think that that sort of sums up where we're at with politics and where this election is going. And I think there are major, you know, if Labour win a huge majority in terms of democratic terms on climate, that's a really dangerous place to be. And I think that we as a climate movement, and from that I don't just mean NGOs, I mean people across the spectrum interested in climate, need to be very alive to the possibilities of what could happen in coming years. You know, Dave touched on what could, what it could look like with reform and the Tories and what what the right of politics could look like and the influence that can have on, poli have on climate politics. And I think we all need to find ways of reassuring each other and ourselves that there are positive stories to come from it and that people feel really passionately about their communities and they feel really passionately that we want to have a positive future and a vision. And I would love for politicians to be able to, you know, follow on that tangent that it needs to be a positive story, not one full of risks and opportunities, but actually one of opportunities. And that has to me has to be the core message that comes both through the general election into a new parliament. We are in, a critical decade and it's very easy to feel very overwhelmed and I think the message is just to try and keep that at bay with some like mix of political reality but also that there are so many people out there that want to make such a difference and that we all have a shared future. Thank you so much absolutely Dave um, your last remarks. Thank you all right uh, yeah look Holly said a lot of it I think um empathy and reassurance are so important right now i think a lot of people uh matthew used this you know i don't think you use this exact word but this idea of reassuring there's a reassurance job to be done right now in communications that like this stuff is good and it will be fine and you could be part of it and it's part of all the good stuff you want and broadly like good climate communication keeps climate and all of what the policy things mean in practice in the good I want that camp and not in the I'm scared of the, the impacts of that camp. It's a very crude, obvious thing to say. 
And from a signal, from a noise point of view, our job in communications is always as much as possible to be in that space of here's something you want and why this will be brilliant. Something you thought was your idea in the first place, something your kids are telling you is a great idea, keeping it there, keeping it real and specific and tangible. So that's the job. It's the job always. And I think at, at election time, you know, we can all find, I think, some of the debate a bit uh a bit much sometimes but the, the, the holding on to that big picture is really important i think in in comms absolutely um matt um yeah it's hard to add anything because i agree with all these things i would just say like as a very very quick summary um what actually needs to happen is like big policy making that talks about security and talks about uh the cost of living crisis but done in a way that sounds like it's just common sense. And I think for us to, uh, yeah, push these big policies and speak about them in a way that's common sense and feels material in people's lives is the most important thing. Excellent. Thank you so much again, um, Holly, Dave and Matt uh, for your time and for the audience for sticking with us this long. There's a very quick two question uh, feedback form that um, my colleague Lauren will be sharing in the chat um, and Dave on the screen. So if you could just take out 15 seconds um, to answer two questions from the feedback form that would really help um, the rest of our team to see um, how useful you found this. And again, um, our colleague Lauren has shared the links to the um, uh, Talking Climate on the Doorstep, as well as getting the climate story right uh, links in the chat. Um, uh, if you want to take a look um, at what Dave shared in his presentation. And yeah, thank you so much, everyone.